Welcome to this latest episode of Learning is the New Working, a podcast where I, Chris Peary, ask the questions that you, chief learning officers, talent leaders, designers, and learning geeks, want answered from workplace learning stakeholders and change makers. Here in season two, we're exploring the theme of change. Why? Because we talk a lot about the urgent need to change the way we offer training and learning and development services, how the world of work itself is changing, and how the economy is undergoing a massive and profound process of disruption and change. Too often, this change is presented as negative, but perhaps not all of the changes we're seeing are scary, and certainly not all of the old attributes of the workplace are worth hanging on to. If nothing else, then surely our own ability as learners, leaders, and managers to embrace change is the attribute we want to develop the most. So let's work together to learn about change this season via conversations with senior practitioners at companies like Airbnb and LinkedIn. We'll also get industry perspective from some major players, including Degreed. Talking to these highly experienced people has taught me to question some of my own assumptions, and I think it'll do the same for you. Can we also give a shout out to this episode's sponsor, Humentum? Humentum is a global membership organization of international NGOs that provides training, convening, and support to organizations that are working for social good. Please visit them at www.humentum.org and support them if you can with donations of time, expertise, content, and services. Your support will absolutely help thousands of people who do good work do it even more effectively. We're kicking off season two with a really special guest, Airbnb's Director of Learning, Kate Shaw. A truly impressive workplace learning influencer, Kate's had the good fortune to work at three amazing companies, Lucasfilm, Apple, and now Airbnb. In all of these stimulating environments, she's focused on helping people and organizations experiment, learn, and grow. Not only did she do great work, she also loved each experience, as you're about to hear. My back and forth with Kate was so engaging that I forgot to watch the clock. So we're making this a special two-part learning is the new working. Part one today and part two will drop in the next two weeks. In this first part, we cover what Kate is up to now in terms of her gig at Airbnb and what it means to work at one of the world's most interesting market redefiners. Many of us, including me, are fascinated by this company's dramatic rise, and Kate shares some of the great insights about how this happened. In the second half, Kate and I dive into a more philosophical conversations around the core questions of ethics and where we need to go with workplace learning. So I hope you really stay for the whole ride. Let's listen in to my conversation with Airbnb's Kate Shaw. Kate, uh, welcome to Learning is the New Working. And boy, what an amazing uh, and accomplished resume that you sort of built for yourself. Um, Thanks a lot for your time. Oh, I'm so excited to be here. Thanks for having me. Great. I think our audience um, is going to like to hear from you about your career progression. uh, And I hope we'll get to that. Um, but uh, I've had a couple of opportunities to work with you and and sort of do some learning together. And I know that you have some really interesting perspectives on topics that are front and center for us here um, on the Learning Futures Group mission. Uh, So let's talk about a couple of things. The current backdrop, like Airbnb and the culture and the challenges um, that you're facing there running the learning group uh, Mm -hmm. in a a hyper-growth environment, and then let's also talk about some of your um, the influences and the people that you look to for guidance and, and ideas in terms of your work practice. Will that work? Mm-hmm. That works great. Sounds fun. Great. So um, the typical um, uh, learning is the new working uh, introductions, kind of rapid fire stuff. Uh, tell me what part of the world you live in now um, mm-hmm. and, and why. So I live in San Francisco. 
um, because I used to think that I was sort of a depressed nihilist, but I've really discovered uh, the hard way that I'm actually a bit of an Epicurean at heart. And San Francisco uh, is a really good place for people like me. Oh my gosh. It's a foodie town for sure. And, uh, <laughs> yep. and, 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 yep. and a place of innovation. I, I spent a lot of time living there myself. I, I love that city. It's, it's my, it's my spiritual home. So we, we got that in common. Um, uh, what did you study Kate at university and why did you study it and, and how does it play into your work today? Yeah, boy, that's a really good question. And I think I'm still trying to figure it out. So um, I actually studied Russian. I went to Russia when I was a, a high school student. It completely blew my mind. Um, they were the 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 cursed enemy at the time, of course. Mm, yeah. um, this was sort of right in the, the midst of the Cold War. Mm. Um, but my experience there told me that that the people in Russia were so incredibly different and yet so strangely familiar at the same time. I would say it opened my eyes to a much, much bigger world um, that I was really curious to learn more about. It was also, you know, looking back, I didn't know this at the time, but looking back, I think it was the beginning of the some of my most important life skills. And this is really sort of answering your question, how does this relate to where I am today, which is mm -hmm. um, it, it started my path on throwing myself into an entirely unfamiliar environment and then and then having to work really, really fast to figure it out. Understanding that there are other perspectives out there that are as equally valid as my own, and that it was really on me to better understand them, um, knowing that they could make my world so much richer if I did. Um, so yeah, I studied Russian. I studied Russian history in college. Um, I don't use Russian a whole lot anymore, <laughs> um, but certainly those life skills have paid forward in a big, big way. Interesting. And so the, the high school visit sort of um, sort of ignited your passion for learning the language. And, and I know you spent yeah. time there in, in Prague and East Central Europe generally afterwards yep. as well, right? Yep. Yep, exactly. Where, why, 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 Kate, do you do the work that you do? Maybe you've hinted at it a little bit. Um, yeah. And, and would you say that you have a sort of personal mission or a sort of career mission? Yeah, I think I do. I, 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 and, and again, like this is one of those things that I think you start to realize um, upon reflection, right? So I was the youngest of five kids. I had a stay at home mom. I had a dad in the Navy um, who died when I was actually really little. And my mom went off to work. She had, she had five kids ages, you know, four to 16. Um, mm -hmm. And watching her as I grew up, what I started to see was that my mom was working so, so hard. She had a family of five to feed. She had never worked outside the home. And yet the way that she was treated at work was really, frankly, not good. She had a pretty mm. tough experience. Even though she was a really top performer in her office, there were ways in which she wasn't treated particularly well because she was really, frankly, at the time, the only woman in her office. Right. What um, kind of work did she do, can I ask? She was a financial planner. Okay. So she was a, a professional, planner who, professional role. Yeah, absolutely. So, so, you know, and it was one that required a lot of study and education and personal mm -hmm. certifications and, you know, qualifications that she worked really slowly over time to build. Mm -hmm. um, and she amassed a real following people that really connected with her. And, um, and even though she was the top salesperson, top, top performer in her office, she was excluded from a lot of opportunities, conversations that, that frankly, she should have had the opportunity to participate in. And and watching her, I think what sort of sat in the back of my mind is, boy, if my mom is that smart and she can't thrive at work, then what is work about? And and how mm. other how 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 does that struggle show up for other people? And and how do we given that we spend hours and hours of our lives at work, that it's the place where so many of wanna Real, so many of us want to realize our own personal dreams and amb mm -hmm. ambitions and aspirations and, frankly, talents. Like, what does it mean about the world of the work that so many of us can't do that? Um, and and so I think I think for me the 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 big mission is how do we make the world of work really truly a better place that really makes the in such a way that it makes the world a better place? And then from the perspective of learning. How do we support people in that experience so that they can really learn and thrive and grow and bring to that environment even more than they thought that they were capable of in the first place? Hmm, that's, a, that's a really interesting story. You know, I was talking to some people this morning about, you know, there's a lot of anxiety around the change in the workplace and the robots are coming and all that. Uh, you know, we forget that there's 
lots about the workplace even today that's really not very desirable. We, we were sort of pointing to the data from uh, OECD about like even in the US today, women are paid on average 18% less for the same work as men. Yeah. And so I think, yeah. um, you know, we sometimes get scared about the change, um, but but really there is there are some things that we need to drive out of this um, and, and get smarter about. Absolutely. I mean, I think I think there's no question the future of work is going to be uh, a very different beast from what my mom experienced. Um, and, and all of us are going to have to reckon with that in some way, shape or form. I think that the reality is, is that when we're really all tapping into the very best of ourselves and we also understand how to tap into the best of what others have to provide, we all win. At the end of the day, we all win. We make this sort of, and I, I sort of, I fear that the, the vantage point that some people could have is that, is that this is actually going to be a lose lose proposition that the, the sort of creation or, 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 uh, uh, realization of AI in the workplace and and the the encroachment of technology in our workplaces is going to mean it's going to bring about a level of scarcity that's going to make us compete mm. and actually and actually further alienate one another. I actually don't think we can afford to take that risk. I think really what we want to do is try and figure out how do we not only learn to work with the machines better, but how do we also better understand what is our real capacity as humans and how do we embrace that, knowing that there's really at the end of the day going to be enough to go around. Well, I think um, one of my favorite fu future quotes that I use too much is William Gibson's, the future's already here. It's just not evenly distributed. And yeah. one of the places when I think about the future of work, one of the places where that's sort of playing out is really the place where, where you go to work every day. Um, and that's yeah. Airbnb. I I'm thinking of calling this episode I hope you have other ideas uh, based, <laughs> based on a conversation that you and I had uh, uh, before um, about about the history of Airbnb. Can you tell us the backstory of this extraordinary company and, and maybe touch on that quote as well? Yeah, I'd love to. So, so we were founded by by um, three founders, two of whom were roommates. Um, they had both gone to RISD together. They had moved to San Francisco. They were dirt poor. Uh, they were designers. There was a design conference coming into town. And, uh, you know, Joe Gebbia looked at Brian Chesky and basically said, Hey, why don't we just blow up some air beds, throw them on the ground and, and then tell people, hmm. sell them, tell the, tell people who are coming into town that we've got these air beds and, and, you know, maybe that'll help us make the rent this month. And they put it out there at this design conference that they had these three air beds. Somehow people took them up on right. it. They uh, came into town, stayed with them. And that was really the very first Airbnb experience. It was, it was three strangers coming into a home and being hosted by Joe and Brian in a way that, um, really forged a friendship that still exists today. So, so, you know, after that whole experience, they thought, well, what if this were a thing? What if this could be a company? They pulled in their friend, Nate Bilcharzik, and, and they started to get some work together. They started to, you know, show it to investors. And as you might imagine, for three young men going out to investors and pitching this idea, our idea is to, you know, put together a platform that will enable strangers to open their doors <laughs> and have strangers come into their homes and sleep in their beds. And and they were, of course, at the time, repeatedly told, absolutely not. That's not happening. That's the most ridiculous idea. And one of and one of the most powerful investors that they met with said, I sure hope this is the only this is not the only idea that you're working on. Yeah. Surely I hope you have other ones. Um you know, and they've had the last laugh. I'll say. Ten years later, I'll say. it's an extraordinary company, and and they've proven a lot of those naysayers wrong. Talk a little bit about the growth and the in, sort of incredible numbers that that uh, that the company's hitting. Airbnb is just a little over ten years old yeah. now. Um, we are in eighty-one thousand cities worldwide. We have six million listings worldwide. We have just crossed the threshold of having hosted a half a billion nights on the platform. Um, we are now worth about, you know, by la latest estimates, based on our last funding round, about thirty-one billion dollars. Um, you know, you compare that to Hilton, which is a hundred years old, it's worth twenty-five billion dollars. Yeah. Um, so this is an organization that's seen extraordinary growth in an incredibly short amount of time. Um, and uh, that's been nothing short of an extraordinary ride with, of course, lots of moments to celebrate along the way and, and a lot of learnings and a lot of hard work.